Today I'm going to be building and testing out an XT IDE Revision 4 kit from Glitchworks. I wasn't sure I was going to make this video, but several of you asked me to, so here we are. I'll be soldering this thing together and slapping it into my PC. Hopefully I can get it running and show off some of the ways it can keep an old PC going. So let's get started. A couple of short caveats. First, there's a lot of soldering in this video, so if you don't like to watch liquid metal flowing into little holes, feel free to skip that part. I will hopefully be showing some cool stuff running on my PC at the end. Second, I'm going to be saying the word solder a lot. That's how Americans pronounce it, so if you're offended by hearing an accent different from yours, then it's probably best to switch off now. The XT IDE allows you to use more modern storage options on older PCs that have 8-bit ISA slots. A lot of people don't realize this, but you really can't use anything but an old MFM hard drive in an original PC or XT without this. There was never such a thing as an 8-bit IDE card back then, and old MFM hard drives are all slowly dying. I've got one here myself. It's a hard card, a neat little drive on a card that I'd love to keep using, but have a listen to it spinning down. So yeah, you need a way to replace those old hard drives, back up the data on them to a modern PC, and get software onto these machines that doesn't require buying floppy disks like it's really 1981. I went ahead and ordered not just this kit, but also an IDE to CF adapter that has an external facing port for convenience, and a small CF card. I figured that a sub 1 gigabyte card would have better luck running on this thing than something bigger. The hard drive it's replacing is only 20 megabytes, so 256 megabytes is a more than tenfold upgrade, and more than anyone would ever really need on an original IBM PC. I can always buy more cards if I need them. You can buy completed XT IDE cards, but the kit version is a lot cheaper and only requires basic soldering skills. No instructions are included, but the board is nicely labeled and it comes with everything you need. It is true that you can mess things up without even knowing what you did wrong and check your soldering seems to be the default response to most tech support questions in the XT to IDE forum. So if you're not comfortable with soldering, just buy a completed board. But I thought it looked simple enough even for my hobby level skills, and it's my idea of some cheap fun. I chose to begin with the small stuff and work my way up. So first go in the tiny decoupling capacitors and resistors. I bend the legs a bit on the back side to hold them in place while I solder. I tin the tip, and I'm purposely showing you that this time to head off comments about it. You should always tin the tip, people, early and often. It's always tough to get a good camera angle when soldering. Sorry about that, but don't worry, I think it gets better later. But I do want to show at least part of every step in the process of putting this card together. I snip off the legs with a standard wire clipper. All the little caps are in, as well as the four resistors. If you're building one of these yourself and aren't overly familiar with electrical circuits, make sure not to mix up the resistors. Easiest thing to do is just find a picture of a completed board and copy it, paying attention to the small details or you could just learn how to read the stripes. Next it was time to move on to the chips. I don't pretend to know what each of these does individually, though the socketed ones the EEPROM. But in keeping with my strategy, I started with the smaller chips and moved up. I also tried to do the top and bottom rows on the board together because it just seemed easier. Some of you may notice that I was using a little too much solder at the beginning here. I realized that and adjusted later. All the other chips followed. 
And to be honest, they're all pretty much the same, so no point showing me soldering all of them. The board's already about half done. That's all the soldered on chips. All that's left is the EEPROM socket, dip switches, jumpers, LED, single electrolytic capacitor, and the IDE connector. The EEPROM socket came next, and truthfully I think something went wrong here, but I'm not 100% sure what. I ended up having to desolder and resolder this completely. That's one lesson about soldering at least. Very little is unfixable. inserting the EEPROM chip. You can see that it wouldn't seat all the way in. Most likely a bit of solder got into the socket somehow, but usually that's not really fixable since it can be next to impossible to clean that out from the inside. Still, I got to work and completely undid my soldering. Unfortunately I didn't film that part, and I did it again. The jumper pins come in a solid block that you have to break apart. This was easy and strangely satisfying for the most part, though the last one required sawing through because I had no leverage to break it at that point. If you build this kit, make sure to count off the right number of pins. Here's the resoldering of the EEPROM socket. I tested it before this, so I knew at this point that the chip fit. The board's almost done. Here I'm placing the LED and electrolytic cap. I left these until near the end because they're tall, and from this point on I have to prop the card up on something to work on it. And here we go with the last major piece, the IDE connector. If you do this yourself, make sure you hold the connector flat against the card as you solder it. It can be tricky. You'll notice that I solder the corners first to hold it in place before doing the rest. The last part of construction is adding the bracket, which is just a matter of two screws. And the board is done. I can honestly say I'm not even all that embarrassed about my soldering. I think it looks reasonably good for a hobbyist. The entire process took me about two hours, including desoldering and resoldering the socket. Final task before whacking it in the PC is to set the dip switches. I found a couple diagrams on minus zero degrees.net that showed the default settings for each bank and decided that was probably good enough for me. I'm going to need two slots for this, one for the card itself and one for the external CF adapter. I don't like wasting that extra slot. I actually thought about just running the cable outside the computer and leaving the CF adapter hanging, but for now this'll do. Taking the old hard drive out is a no-brainer, obviously. I also remove the serial card since I'm not using it at the moment, but I'll probably want that slot back at some point. And finally, the XT IDE card goes in place. Well, eventually it goes in place. Just trust me on this.
Incidentally, this is the point where I realized that not only is my CGA card bent outward, but my AST six pack plus is bent inward. Hmm. Here's the CF adapter going into place. And connect it up to the XT IDE. Should be good to go now. This is what it looks like on the outside. I can easily remove the card to add new software to it via my modern PCs without having to open the case. Now, keep in mind that like a cooking show, this is a card I had prepared earlier. Using a virtual machine on my modern desktop, I had installed DOS 5.0 onto it and made it bootable. Let's test it out. BIOS comes up and the card is recognized. That's promising. Let's select it as the boot device. Damn it. Believe it or not, that's actually a good sign. The missing operating system error comes from the storage device itself, which means that even though it should be booting and isn't, the controller is at least reading the CF card. So seems like my soldering work is probably okay. It took quite a bit of trial and error going through various software solutions to fix this problem, and I also got a little help through the Vintage Computer Federation forums. I'll write the gist of what I did in the video description, and you can ask in a comment if you want more details. But long story short, I had to install DOS 3.2 on it on the PC itself, giving me just a single 32 megabyte partition. But eventually, we've got a C prompt. I immediately copied over some demos and games to test it out, and I hooked up my Sony KVM monitor through the composite input to see what the original PC CGA card could really do graphically. This is the 8088 mile per hour demo. I'll be talking more about this when I do my full review of the IBM 5150, but I'll bet you never thought it could do stuff like this. Here's Burger Time. It's missing the in-game music, and the sound effects are about what you'd expect from the PC speaker. But look at those graphics. It's almost arcade perfect. Here's California Games, a late 80s game that I think most people associate with the supposedly more graphically oriented machines from Commodore and Atari, not to mention the NES. I admit that I've never learned how to play this game, by the way. And here's Ms. Pac-Man, another game that looks very close to its arcade original even on the lowly original PC. Graphically, while the C64 and Atari 8-bit have extra details like the ghost's eyes, the PC version is running at twice the resolution, though there's no way to describe the control other than ass. My next step was to back up that old hard drive that I'd taken out earlier. Time to pop the case open again. I removed the CF adapter from its gate and put it aside. Then I put the hard card back into place. I wasn't sure what was going to happen booting with these in there together, but there's only one way to find out. Turns out the XT to IDE BIOS just adds it to the boot menu, listing the hard card as a foreign hard disk. So far, so good. Let's boot from the CF card and see if both drives are visible. So here's drive C, which is the CF card. Notice how long it takes to calculate the free space remaining. And yep, here's drive D, which is the hard card. Looks like it should be easy enough to back this thing up to the CF. 
And sure enough, X-Copy seemed to work pretty much fine. I did have several drive errors on the D drive, as I was worried might happen. This drive is just in bad shape. I'm surprised it still works at all. I tried hitting retry the first couple times, but eventually just had to select ignore and get what I could off the drive. The XT IDE and CF adapter both do have status lights, not that you can see them during normal use. Let's test the copy we just made. Here I'm trying to run Quattro Pro off the CF card. And it seems to run just fine. All that static you see, by the way, is a known CGA artifact. There's nothing wrong with my hardware. Let's try Paradox, a popular relational database program for business at the time. Does anyone have a need for this program at this point? Probably not, but it was on the hard drive, and this is apparently the last version that'll run on an 8088, so let's try to preserve it. And unfortunately, no dice with this one. It never stops loading. This is one of the programs that had errors when copying. Interestingly, I checked and it does still work on the hard card itself. So maybe it's some weird early copy protection, or maybe for some reason one sector of the drive can be read but not copied. In any case, I'm sure I can get Paradox 3.5 from somewhere. So, one last check of the CF card's main directory to verify that it looks like the D drive, and I'm going to call this done for now. The card is working and doing what I need it to. There's still more to do, but then there always is. The next steps are going to be to update this thing to DOS 5.0 somehow and get some more and bigger partitions. And I need to update the XT IDE BIOS since it's shipping with an old one right now for reliability reasons. But updating shouldn't be too hard now that I've got it working. I will miss that hard card, and maybe someday I'll try to fix it. But hard drives that old are just going to keep dying, and there's not much we can do about it. At least there are modern solutions like the XT IDE to keep our stuff going. <laughs> <laughs>